Hi, Mayor Lloyd Winnicky here. A special greetings to our young citizens who I know are getting frustrated being inside all the time. I hope you're having some fun. I hope you're getting to read a little bit. And most importantly, I hope you're reading for some fun. We're going to take a couple of minutes today to read something fun from one of my favorite childhood authors, and I hope one of your favorites, Dr. Seuss. So today we're going to read Scrambled Eggs Super by Dr. Seuss. I don't like to brag and I don't like to boast, said Peter T. Hooper. But speaking of toast and speaking of kitchens and ketchup and cake and kettles and stoves and the stuff people bake. Well, I don't like to brag, but I'm telling you, Liz, that speaking of cooks, I'm the best that there is. Why, only last Tuesday when Mother was out, I really cooked something worth talking about. You see, I was sitting there resting my legs, and I happened to pick up a couple of eggs. And I sort of got thinking, it's sort of a shame that scrambled eggs always taste always the same. And that's because ever since goodness knows when, they've always been made from the eggs of a hen. Just a plain common hen. What a dumb thing to use with all the other fine eggs you could use cook to choose. And so I decided that just for a change, I'd scramble a new kind of egg on the range. Some kind, some fine fancy eggs that no other cooks cook. Like the eggs of the ruffled necked salamagooks. A salamagooks? Say, they should be good. So I went out and found some as quick as I could. And while I was lugging them back to the house, I happened to notice a tizzletop grouse in a tree down the street, and I knew from her looks that her egg and the egg of the salamagooks ought to mix mightily well, ought to use, ought to taste simply super when scrambled together by Peter T. Hooper. And so I took those eggs home and I frizzled them up, and I added some sugar, two thirds of a cup, and a small pinch of pepper, and also a pound of horseradish sauce that was sitting around. There also, and also some nuts, and I tasted the stuff, and it tasted quite fine, but not quite fine enough. To make the best scramble that's ever been made, a cook has to hook the best eggs ever laid. So I drove to the country, quite rather far out, and I studied the birds that were flitting about. I looked with a great care at a mop-noodled finch. I looked at a beagle-beaked, bald-headed grinch. And also I looked at a shade roosting quail, who was roosting right under a last lax tail. And I looked at a spritz and a flannel wing jay, and I just didn't stop. I kept right on my way, because they didn't have eggs. They weren't laying that day. Then suddenly, boy, up the hill a short space, birds. They were laying all over the place. Great, happy, gay families with uncles and cousins, all laying fine, strictly fresh laid eggs by the dozens. Why, well, I'd have a scrambled more super than super. Scrambled eggs, super de duper de booper. Special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. I picked out the eggs in a most careful way. I picked only those that I knew were grade A. I only took eggs from the very best fowls, so I didn't take eggs from the twiddle owls, because I knew that the eggs of those fellows who twiddle taste sort of like dust from inside a bass fiddle. I went for the kind that were mellow and sweet, and the world's sweetest eggs were the eggs of the queet, which is due to those very sweet trout which they eat. And those trout, well, they're sweet because they only eat wogs. And wogs, after all, are the world's sweetest frogs. And the reason they're sweet is, whenever they lunch, it's always the world's sweetest bees that they munch. And the reason no bees can be sweeter than these, they only eat blossoms of the bezel nut trees. And the bezel nut tree blossoms are sweeter than sweet. And that's why I nabbed several eggs from the queet. But I passed up the eggs of a bird called a strudel, who's sort of a stork, but with fur like a poodle. For they say the eggs of this kind of stork are gooey like glue and they stick to your fork. And the yolks of the eggs, I'm told, taste like fleece, while the whites taste like every old bicycle grease. The places I hiked to, the roads that I rambled, to find the best eggs that have ever been scrambled. I hunted new birds along wild, tangled trails. 
through gullies and gulches, down dingles and dales. I wriggled my way and I crawled at a creep through a forest of ferns that, were, that was 40 miles deep. And I mushed through the brush till I found a fine quigger whose eggs are big as a pinhead, no bigger. Then I went to the eggs of a long legger quong. Now this quong, well, she's built just a little bit wrong for her legs are so terribly, terribly long that this has to say, this has to lay eggs 20 feet in the air and they drop with a plop to the ground from up there. So unless you can catch them before the eggs crash, you haven't got eggs, you've got long legger hash. Eggs, I collected 302, but I needed still more. And I suddenly knew that the job was too big for one fellow to do. So I telegraphed north to some friends at Fazol, which is 10 miles, so just beyond the North Pole. And they all of them jumped in their catam aside, which is sort of a boat made of a sea leopard's hide, which they sailed out to sea to go looking for grice, which is sort of a bird which lay, lays eggs on the ice which they grab with a tool which is known as a squitch because those eggs are too cold to be touched without a witch. And while they were sending those eggs, I got word of a bird that does nothing, that does something that's always unheard of. It's hard to believe, but this bird's called the pelf. Lay eggs that are three times as big as herself. How that pelf ever learned such a difficult trick, I never found out, but I found that egg quick and I managed to get it down on the nest and home to the kitchen along with the rest. But I didn't stop then, because I knew of some ducks by the name of single file Zumzimian Zucks, who stroll single file through the mountains of Zooms, quite oddly enough with their eggs and all on their thumbs. And some fellows in Zooms, whom I had happened to know, just happened to capture a thousand or so and they wrapped up their eggs and they mailed them by air, marked special delivery, handle with care. I needed more helpers, and so for assistance, I called up a fellow called Allie Long Distance, and Allie, as soon as he hung up the phone, picked up a small basket and started alone to climb the steep crags and the jags of Mount Struku to fetch me the egg of Mount Struku Cuckoo. Now these Mount Struku Cuckoos are rather small gals, but these Mount Struku cuckoos have lots of big pals. They dive from the skies with the wild cackling shricks, and they jabbed at his legs and they stabbed at his cheeks with their yammering, clamoring, hammering beaks. But Ali, brave Ali, he fought his way through, and he sent me that egg as he knew he would do for my scrambled eggs, super de duper de booper special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. In the meanwhile, of course, I was keeping real busy collecting the eggs of the three eyelashed tizzy. They're quite hard to reach, so I rode on the top of a hamakalimakashim ikamasham ikamashnap. Then I found a great flock of southwest facing cranes, and I guess they've got something that's wrong with all their brains with this kind of a crane when she's guarding her nest will always stand facing precisely southwest. So to get at those eggs wasn't hard in the least. I came from behind from precisely northeast. And I captured the egg of a grickly gractus who lays them up high in a prickly cactus. And I went for some ziffs. They're exactly like zuffs, but the ziffs live on cliffs and the zuffs live on bluffs. And seeing how bluffs are exactly like cliffs, it's mighty hard telling the zuffs from the ziffs. But I know that the egg that I got from the bluffs, if it wasn't a ziffs from the cliffs, was a zuffs. Now I needed the egg of a moth-wielding sneff, who's a bird who's so big she scares people to death. And this awful big bird, well, the reason they name her the moth-watching sneff is cause that's how they tame her. She's like watching moths, sort of quiets her mind. And while she's watching you sneak up behind and you yank out her egg. So I got one, of course, with the help of some friends and a very fast horse. If you want to get eggs who 
you can't buy in a store. You have to do things never thought of before. Like to get the egg of every small doff, we had to pry off all the mountain top. Then I heard some birds who lay eggs, if you please, that taste like the air in which holes in the Swiss cheese. So they live in big Zinzan Zinzabar, Zanzibar trees. So I, I ordered a tree full. The job was immense, but I needed those eggs and said, hang the expense. I still needed one more. I saved it for last. The egg of the frightful bombastic Agnes. And that bird is so mean and that bird is so fast that I had to escape on a Jill, a Jack, a Jast, a fleet-footed beast who can run like a deer but looks sort of different. You can steer him by ear. All through with the searching and through with the looking, I had all I needed and now for the cooking. I rushed to the kitchen, the place where I had stacked them. I rolled up my sleeves, I unpacked them and cracked them, and shucked them and chucked them in 99 pans. Then I mixed in some beans, I used 55 cans. Then I mixed in some ginger, nine prunes and three figs, and parsley, quite sparsely, just 22 sprigs. Then I added six cinnamon sticks and a clove, and my scramble was ready to go on the stove. And you know how they tasted? They tasted just like, well, they tasted exactly, exactly just like, like scrambled eggs, super de duper de booper, special deluxe, a la Peter T. Hooper. And that is scrambled eggs super, a mouthful on every page.